Nature's Archive Podcast, a Jumpstart Nature production. You know conifers, right? Those wonderful trees that produce cones, and they include some of the tallest, whitest, and oldest living trees on Earth. Think giant sequoia, coast redwood, and bristlecone pines. Conifers are also the oldest lineage of trees on Earth, and this is just a small taste of what conifers have to offer. My guest today is Michael Kaufman. He's a lifelong educator, ecologist, and author, and also the founder of Backcountry Press. And by the way, he's also an expert in conifers. So today we discuss the many things that make conifers such an amazing group of plants. Michael walks us through their evolutionary history, what makes them different from other trees, and gives us a special look at the amazing diversity of conifers in his area, the Klamath region of far northern California. Michael also discusses how he turned his love of conifers into two amazing projects. With the creation of his first book, Conifer Country, Michael established Backcountry Press. It has since grown to produce several wonderful natural history books, and he gives us a preview of some new ones due out soon. And the second project is his establishment of the 360-mile Bigfoot Trail. It's a playful name for a truly serious trail if you're into backpacking and botanizing, and it boasts 32 conifer species. You can find Michael at michaelkaufman.net and also on Instagram and iNaturalist, and we have those links in the show notes. So without further delay, please enjoy my discussion with Michael Kaufman. Michael, thank you for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you here. When I learned about your work, I honestly got very inspired by what you've been able to accomplish. I see a lot of parallels in what you're doing and what I would like to do. So I'm hoping that not only can my listeners learn from you today, but hopefully I can learn from you as well. Thank you. That's nice of you to say. Top level goal, I think, for both of us is connecting people to the natural world. And um, that's why we're here to chat. Absolutely. And uh, in a little bit of serendipity, I, so I guess this was in December. I went out on a nature walk with a friend of mine, and he was telling me about this field guide to Manzanitas. And... And I was like, really? Such a thing exists? And I thought I was on top of the field guide world. I have a big collection. Somehow I had missed that field guide. And sure enough, it was one authored by you. And uh, and then I found that you also had a field guide to conifers in the Pacific Slope. And uh, at that exact same time, the serendipitous part is our mutual acquaintance, uh, Griff Griffith, connected us. And that was all within a matter of three days. Wow, uh, that's cool. Yeah, I've always been a fan of field guides. Like, I, I feel like it's one of these things. I was always a collector. I used to collect baseball cards, but I also collected birds and I collected the insects. And then I started to collect the trees in the yard. When I say that, I mean, starting to figure out what they were using those old golden guides. It's been real a real exciting path for me to pursue the idea of new field guides. So yeah, thanks for picking those up and checking them out. I'm jumping ahead a little bit here in in what I was planning to talk about, but what I like about them is you show exactly where to go look for some of the species in particular, and I'm looking forward to putting that to good use here over the next couple of years. It's a unique aspect of the guides that you've put together. Thank you. Why don't we back up several steps then, and can you tell me just a little bit about where you grew up and how you got interested in nature? Sure. Yeah, I grew up in Virginia. And basically, you know, my parents enjoyed nature, but they weren't passionate about taking us out into nature. But I lived in in a nice place along the James River where I was able to get into the national park there near Jamestown and see some wild places. Got in the but the big thing for me was when I hit high school, I had this science teacher, Charles Dubay, amazing man who developed field courses for high school kids. My senior year, I had a two-period class, and we would put on our hip waders, we'd wade through beaver dams, and we'd identify trees with leaves. And then later in the year, we had to identify the deciduous trees without leaves in the swamps. And that, as soon as I was halfway through that class, I I knew I was going to get a biology degree. So I went to Virginia Tech, got a biology degree, four quick years, thankfully. And when I was a senior, I found this publication hanging on the wall called Environmental Opportunities. And there were jobs in California teaching environmental education to kids. And I applied and I got a job and I moved to Tulare County. And I lived in near a little town called Springville. And it was at the southern end of Sequoia National Park. So I got to hang out with giant sequoias and foxtail pines on the weekends. And it was just 
that was my life pursuit. I was really fortunate to find it so quickly, I think. And I pursued more environmental education. I taught for the Los Angeles County Office of Education down in a little town called Wrightwood in the San Gabriel Mountains. And I was reluctant to move to Southern California. Well, I guess I was in Central Southern in Tulare County. But then when I moved to real Southern California, I thought, oh gosh, I'm going to be close to LA. There's not going to be any nature. And it couldn't have been further from the truth. The San Gabriel Mountains are one of the wildest mountain ranges in the state because they're so steep. I think John Muir called them the steepest mountains he ever hiked in right along the San Andreas Fault. But what happened for me was, again, like when I was in Tulare County hanging out with giant sequoias and foxtail pines, when I was in the transverse ranges there of the San Gabriels, but also on the edge of the Mojave and the Sonoran and the Great Basin of California and even Arizona and Nevada, I would get out to those places on the weekends. I would climb mountains and at the top of these mountains would be conifers. So that for me started to pique my interest in conifers. Why were they there? Why were they isolated on these mountaintops? You know, it wasn't always the case. There's some lower elevation pinions and junipers out in the desert, but to find these strange isolated stands on mountaintops, like for instance, on Baden Powell in the San Gabriel mountains, you can see limber pine and also these relic populations of Sierra juniper. So these sort of biogeographical anomalies started to puzzle me and I started to seek out, well, where are other things like this? Where are other rare trees or animals and even other plants and birds? So that's been my path and then documenting that stuff. And it used to be just in a journal. I have shelves and shelves of my old paper journals and those journals slowly turned into little websites that I experimented with in the early 2000s. I used to have a website called The Wilderness Birder, where I had this rule where you had to spend a week in the wilderness before a bird list could be legitimate. So anyway, <laughs> just, just, just silly stuff like that. And then that all turned into this passion of uh, creating books. Yeah, that's so many kind of evocative visions as you were talking about that, thinking about the sequoias and then your experience in the San Gabriels. And and I can see so many hooks for you, but was there a moment where you were like, this is a group I want to delve deeply into? Yeah, it was the foxtail pines. You know, I had been to the Sea of the Giant Sequoias and I understood that it was it's a rare species, California endemic. But I went for my first high elevation backpacking trip in Sequoia National Park. We went to Eagle Lake, which is out of the Mineral King. We came to this lake and there were these enormous trees with this beautiful red bark. And if you've ever seen uh, the needles on a foxtail, the way they're just wrapped really tightly in a circle, the bottle brush sort of idea, foxtail, however you want to describe it. I looked it up and I was like, wow, this is another California endemic right next to these giant sequoias. And that was really the, the, the big step for me. And those, you said they're high elevation specialists. They're only in, yeah, they're yeah. Only in the southern... Sierra Nevada. I think they get almost as far north as Bishop in the Southern Sierra Nevada. And then there, there's also stands in the Klamath Mountains. So there are these two disjunct subspecies of Pinus balfouriana, which is the foxtail pine. Very cool. And maybe talking a little bit about conifers in general, making that jump. What makes a conifer a conifer? I mean, they're very different from other tree species. Yeah, they are. And I think that's the other intriguing piece. They're like this ancient lineage, right? So I'll take you on a quick history of plant life. And it was only a mere 425 million years ago or so that plants became compatible with land, right? So this, most plants were in the water. These plants crept onto land. They were non-vascular, meaning they were small things like mosses. Then plants developed this vascular tissue and allowed them to grow up. The next leap was ferns and horsetails, club mosses, things like that. And this vascular tissue, again created this ability for them to grow upwards, not necessarily need to be wet all the time like moss, but also they still were restrictive because they only reproduce with spores. And then about 360, 380 million years ago, based on the fossil record, the first gymnosperms emerged. And this is a large group, and we can go into some detail about that in a minute if we want, but this is a large group that eventually includes the conifers, but they have seeds. And this was a big deal to have a seed because seeds promoted this ability for the plant to remain dormant when conditions weren't ideal. So if it wasn't wet, the seed could sit for a few 
months or whatever, and then the rains came, the seed can germinate. So that really allowed plants to begin their expansion across the landscape. And uh, gymnosperms were followed by the angiosperms about 140 million years ago. That number's shifting a little bit, but these were the flowering plants. But both the gymnosperms and the angiosperms, these are the seed plants of the world. But they have pretty different approaches to survival. But again, this was this relationship with the dormancy and the seed. Gymnosperms have uh, seeds that form on a structure, most typically we know as a cone. And then the angiosperm seeds are enclosed in something, you know, you can picture an apple. An apple holds that seed inside. A wild story, but the real heyday of the conifers was during the Jurassic and or Mesozoic, I should say. And that was when there were about 20,000 species of conifers. And I think what's amazing about this is so you think about how many species there used to be. Now you can think of it as a group in decline because there's only a thousand species of gymnosperms that are left on earth. But what's amazing about those thousand species of gymnosperms, about 620 or 30, I guess it's 630 of those are conifers. They still cover about 30% of the forested land on earth. So even though there's hardly any relative to what there used to be, they still do quite well in the right systems. And those are generally systems north of the 45th parallel, higher on mountaintops and subtropics or temperate regions. And then you think about those boreal forests further north, and they, that's where they really, across North America and uh, Asia, that's where they really cover this vast amount of the landscape. Are angiosperms then direct descendants of gymnosperms? That's the idea, but there's still, to my knowledge, there's been no definitive connection of which or how those angiosperms arose from the gymnosperms. Most likely it's going to come from some connection in the, in the group of Natales, which are things like the ephedras of the California desert or the Welwitchia of South Africa. They think there's probably a connection in there, but uh, has not been specifically pinpointed in the fossil record yet. Yeah, really interesting. So much to discover still. So you talked about how gymnosperms develop the ability to propagate by seed. Can you walk me through that process, the pollination process, or maybe a, a year in the life of a reproducing conifer? Hey, it's Michael here. Have you ever thought about creating a nature podcast for a mission-driven organization? Would you like to work with other nature communicators and conservationists like Griff Griffith and myself? Well, Jumpstart Nature is looking for volunteers to help with editing and production for both Nature's Archive and the Jumpstart Nature podcast. We have details of this and other volunteer opportunities, which range from content creation, social media coordination, website development, and more, all on jumpstartnature.com. Oh, and one more thing. We now also have Nature's Archive merch. It's on the Jumpstart Nature store, so check out the store link on naturesarchive.com or on jumpstartnature.com. Yeah, well, this is the big difference between the angiosperms and the gymnosperms. Gymnosperms are almost exclusively wind pollinated. So they rely on breezes, the pollen blows typically from the male pollen cone to the female seed cone and uh, pollinates that. And this is, can be restrictive if you think about certain conifers on a mountaintop. So like those limber pine I talked about in Southern California, their, their genetics is becoming more and more isolated because the pollen is basically stuck on the mountaintop. So the big shift was with the angiosperms and their ability to coerce animals into that pollination process, m mostly insects, but of course other maybe hummingbirds or bats do things for certain yeah. angiosperms. So that diversification of the angiosperm happened because of that relationship. It also happened when the asteroid hit 65 million years ago, mass extinction, and that was what, that's what led to the major decline of the gymnosperms, where just basically anything under the soil surface survived. And then what reemerged were not necessarily the reptiles, but the mammals. And the mammals began to have, uh, well, and also the, you think about seed dispersal, right? So the mammals helped with the angiosperms and the seed dispersal. Now, obviously, there are conifers that rely on animals for seed dispersal. But so it's a it's complex interactions here. But the bottom line is, the flowering plants relationship with pollinators really launched the diversification. And today there's 
350,000 described flowering plants. It's probably 500 or 600,000 species. Some of them have yet to be described. And then, like I said, there's only 1,000 species of the gymnosperms and 630 conifers in the world. So a major biogeographical shift in, in what was on Earth because of both the asteroid and then, like I said, that relationship with animal pollinators and the flowering plants. I can envision the wind blowing, looking at a conifer and just seeing a cloud of pollen emanating from a conifer. Yeah. And and just the it's mind boggling thinking about how much pollen is actually produced. What's uh, producing the pollen on a typical conifer? And I, I also recognize that there's rarely one answer for, especially for a very diverse group of, of organisms like conifers. So maybe there's a few different scenarios that you want to walk through. Yeah, sure. It depends on environmental conditions to begin with, right? So if the tree's under stress, it might produce more pollen and seed cones in anticipation of a slow decline, or maybe there's a big water year. But basically the bottom line is early in spring, these pollen cones start to develop. So they're developing now, just like we see, and I'm speaking now about more Western North America and the typical regimes here. The bottom line is these things start to develop and emerge in spring and the wind picks up and the seeds start to develop. Typically, d- depending on the conifer, it could take from six months to two years once that pollination process happens. But then those, as those seeds develop in the cones after pollination, they're going to fall at an optimal time depending on the environment that, that conifer is in. So, you know, in Southern California, that optimal time might be October or November, right before typically the first rains come. And that could vary depending on elevation and latitude. And yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the geographic differences, hopefully later. When I was a kid, I inaccurately equated conifers with evergreens. And later I learned that evergreens don't have to be conifers. And then later I learned that conifers are not just pines. There's other groups like spruces and cypress and and so forth. When you look at North America, let's focus on North America a little bit. What groups might you find taxonomically, say if you're in the Northeastern US versus in the Rocky Mountains versus in California? Yeah. So yeah, this is there's a lot to to unpack here, but the bottom line is there are some deciduous conifers. And like you said, there are evergreen angiosperms. But it's a bit if we just want to unpack that for a second, that is a basically a survival strategy, right? So generally, if, if a tree or a shrub or whatever is producing evergreen leaves or needles, it's in it for the long term, right? Pacific silver fir along in the Cascades, Western North America is purported to have the longest surviving needles of any conifer up to 70 years of any plant, really, I think. 70 years they keep these things. So they're invested, right? They're putting their energy in. They're maybe not in a place that's going to see high level of disturbance so that, so let's sit then, then let's flash down to Creekside and alders, the angiosperm that might grow along rivers and creeks across the West, for instance, they do see disturbance, right? They might see flooding, they might see landslides. And because of that, they might invest less in their leaf production. So there's more to the story, but that's just a general way to think about it. If we want to go from there and just think about the evergreen conifers, or so to speak, or the conifers in general of North America, there's basically three families. And there's seven families worldwide, but in North America, there's three. So we're looking at Pinaceae, which are the pines and the spruces and the firs. We're looking at Cupressaceae, which includes redwoods, junipers, what we call cedars, the New World cedars. And then Taxaceae, which is the yew. And there's only a few U species. There's also Terea in California, which is in Texas. So within those groups, if we're looking at an identification and understanding, the pine ACE, the pines the, and the spurs and the spruces, they typically have what we refer to as a typical needle, long, no scales on the needle. So if you think about a pine tree or, a, or your yule tree the, in the house at Christmas time, the fir that, that you might get, they have one long needle. Cupressaceae are, are different. They have scale-like needles. Typically, they have spherical cones. Juniper is a good example. That's one of the few Cupressaceae that go around the world. Most Cupressaceae are interesting, like redwoods and giant sequoias. They're dominant where they live, but they're dominant in very small areas. Junipers are the exception to that because they have this berry cone that's distributed by birds. 
So the juniper has this, this nice typical scale-like needles of Cupris AC, and you can find them across North America, across Europe and, and Africa and Asia. And then taxaceae are unusual. They, their needles look similar to both pine AC and Cupris AC in s- certain instances, but they have a fleshy cone called an aril, and it's really like an undeveloped cone that when they first develop, you can see the scales that you might expect on uh, another conifer, but then they never really mature into that hard woody structure we're most familiar with. So those are the three big groups that, that we would encounter in North America. Are most of those groups observable across most of North America? I know that Klamath region is a hot spot, <laughs> and yeah. we're going to get to that here yeah. in a moment, but I'm curious, having not explored much in, say, the upper Midwest or the Southeast, what one might see in those areas? Yeah, Taxaceae is would be the hard one depending on where you are. There's uh in on the panhandle of uh, Florida. Actually not the panhandle near the near Alabama and Florida. I forget the name of the river. There's two endemic Taxaceae. So there's a Terea and a U that live only there. So that's a wild spot. I've never been there. I'd love to visit. But then you move up into northeast and you Begin to see some U. They're uncommon, but you can find the Canada U there. And then Western North America, specifically on the Pacific Slope and California, you can find the Pacific U. And then California has an endemic terrea, California terrea, they call it. So those are, that would be the hard group to find. But the other two uh, groups, Cupressaceae and Pinaceae, are pretty omnipresent. And then zeroing in on your region in particular, I've heard about this area. I've read about it on your blog, the Miracle Mile. Can you tell me what that is and why it is? Sure. This is really where my conifer fascination exploded. I mentioned I lived in the San Gabriel Mountains and I lived there until I was, oh, I'm 29, I think, and decided I needed to get my teaching credentials. So I moved to Humboldt State. Actually, now it's Cal Poly Humboldt. But the bottom line was I got up here, started to explore the mountains, and I thought I knew my conifers. I thought I knew how to identify stuff. And I started to wander up here and I was, it's like I was in a new, on a new planet. It was really fascinatingly confusing. So I began to really break it down and start to understand this diversity. And the diversity of Northwest California here in the Klamath Mountains is one of the most diverse timber coniferous forests on earth. And it's rivaled by potentially a few places in China. Mount Rainier has challenged us in uh, a, a species diversity per unit area. But the Miracle Mile is an exception in that there are 18 species of conifers in one square mile. And the list is out there. It's on my blog. Uh, it was 17 until about eight years ago. And we discovered the Western Juniper Occidentalis on an isolated slope. And I, when I say discovered these trees are four or 500 years old, so they've been there for a long time. It's just a spot that nobody had ever looked within this sort of, it's an, it's an arbitrary square mile. But the bottom line was D- John Sawyer and Dale Thornburg, who were in the forestry and biology departments at Humboldt State back in the 60s, were exploring around there. Um, actually, they were keyed into this area by Ledyard Stebbins, uh, famous botanist out of Berkeley. But he said, hey, look, we've heard that there uh, are stands of Engel and Spruce in the Klamath Mountains. Can you go verify? So they went into this spot called Blake's Fork on uh, Russian Creek, and they found the Engel and Spruce, which they were the first ones to collect herbarium specimens for this in California. So this is more of a Cascade Rocky Mountain species, sneaks into California and the Klamath. And they continued to walk around, and they were just blown away. They were finding foxtail pines. They were the first ones to discover subalpine fir on a trip soon after that one. And, and this all fell within this area in the Russian wilderness around uh, Russian Peak. And so they named it the Miracle Mile. And the bottom line with this spot is it's at this crossroads. So the Klamath Mountains are a crossroads. If we take a step back, the Klamath Mountains are about the size of Virginia. They are basically south of Mount Shasta a little bit to just north of the Oregon border between the coast and Mount Shasta. So it's this kind of this area of, I think it's about 22,000 square miles or so. So it's big. But it's also this area where the Sierra Nevada meets the Cascades, meets meets the Coast Range, meets the Great Basin, meets the Central Valley. You know, so you get the picture. You've got these. It's the northern end of the California Floristic Province, the southern end of the Pacific Northwest. So it's this the the area that Klamath Mountains in general are crossroads, but the Miracle Mile sort of typifies that crossroads where the wet species 
or the species that prefer more mesic sites meet the species that prefer more xeric sites like the junipers. High elevation meets lower elevation because of the steeper leaf. Rock types intermix, granites and serpentines. And it's just a, it's a wonderland for not just conifers, for all, almost all plants. I think there's 450 species that have been documented in or near the Miracle Mile of vascular plants. So fascinating stuff. The thing I love about it is within this small area, you can see so many different ecological processes at work and the outcomes. You, you hit so many right there from climate to elevation to soil types, competition. You can see it all right there and and walk yeah. away with a hands-on view of these things that that maybe you've only heard about before in textbooks. Yeah. So- 18 species in that area. And then the Klamath in general, how many species? Depending on your boundaries, about 30, I would say 32, but just outside of that, 38. And I'm talking just outside. You can add a couple of cypresses and a couple of you know, other interesting junipers. Mm -hmm. That So yeah, and depending on whether how you consider certain subspecies, the conifers are a little bit of a taxonomic, I wouldn't say mess, but problem that's still being worked out. So aren't, you know, aren't they all? <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. I guess you're right. <laughs> the more we learn, and the more we realize taxonomy doesn't always quite fit the the boundaries that we wish. <laughs> you're exactly right. One thing that I like to try to do with the podcast is help people, hikers, naturalists that are out looking at things, learn more about what they're seeing and also maybe give them some tools to, or maybe some inspiration to go look a little bit more deeply into certain areas. So uh, how does one begin to observe and identify and understand conifers in the field? Yeah, that's a good question. It's confusing. I, I have friends, professors at Humboldt State that are still, and they're not necessarily conifer specialists by any means, but people that are keen observers still shoot me emails. All right, help me out with this thing right here. It's, this is confusing. So when I began to understand, that's why I started to put together my first book called Conifer Country. Conifer Country explores the conifers of the Klamath Mountains. It gives you 27 hikes to get in, see these conifers. And each of those hikes has a list of the conifers that you can expect to see. So that in some ways you can need to start with something like that. So maybe you grab uh, a list from Calflora or iNaturalist, but you do a search of a certain area and then you've got your list before you go. I think that's a good starting point, right? It clean, keeps it clean. Now there could be things that maybe weren't documented on both of those platforms. But those platforms, the databases are getting better and better every minute based on people's community science and passion for, for those sort of projects. But then when you make good observations, maybe you can make a field sketch, take photos, grab the needles. Are they spiky? Are they not? How, are, if they're cones, what do they look like? Are they sitting upright, which is how they sit in furs? Or are they small and spherical? And maybe it's within Cooper's AC, right? So do they have scale-like needles? So it just takes repeated practice, observations. I'd obviously encourage putting that stuff up on iNaturalist. I follow every conifer observation within the Cal California Floristic Province on iNaturalist. So I can't say that I'm on there identifying stuff all the time, but I like to look and see what people are seeing and I will help correct those identifications. As with anything, it's practice, finding the right resources, and challenging yourself to ask new questions. I, I remember with pines, another factor can be the number, the, the bundling, the needle count, how many needles are growing yeah. together. Exactly. Um, yeah. and, and now if I were to maybe go into a more difficult taxa, the cypress, what would you recommend for people? I understand that's one of the most dynamic taxa at the moment in terms of potentially splitting species. Yeah. Yeah. Bottom line with Cubersaceae is your location in a lot of ways. Like I said, they're often dominant, but over small areas, like I, like take redwood or giant sequoia or the cypresses of Southern California. If those cypresses from Southern California, like say the Cuyamaca cypress was taken into a lab and shown to me next to the Paiute cypress, I would probably have a difficult time telling the two apart. But if I saw an observation on a naturalist and I saw that you were in the Southern Sierra Nevada and you got a cypress, then I'm going to know that it's a Paiute cypress. Now, I've got friends like Joey Santor, who swears he can smell the difference between these cypresses. I'm not there oh, wow. yet <laughs> with my ability to smell. But anyway, yeah, I would say if, if, you're, if you are making these observations, definitely grab needles, get a couple of angles, get the top and the bottom of the needle, take a picture of the bark. And if there is 
if there is a cone, definitely shoot the cone. For iNaturalist or Cal Flora, you're going to want to put three or four pictures up per conifer. You read my mind. I was going to ask if you're on iNaturalist helping people. <laughs> Are there projects people can submit their observations to? I know sometimes, like for example, I'm into plant galls. And there are some plant mm -hmm. gall projects. And when you submit your observation to that project, more eyes are on it. More experts are looking at it. Are there similar such projects that people could utilize? I Yeah, I have projects. They're, they're definitely a little bit more obscure. I have just because of the obscurity of the Klamath Mountains. I have a Klamath Mountain geomorphic province that will grab your observation within a polygon. I will see that. I will typically help to identify it if I can. You can even follow genera or families. And that's, like I said, that's what I do for the California Floristic Province. I follow conifer observation within that. I think it's the best social media out there, in my opinion. It's you're following plants, you're following people making observations, and uh, you're contributing to our understanding of where these things are. And I, I don't think my audience is big enough to bury you with requests, but maybe I'll go out on the limb and ask, is it, if someone is, say, outside of California, would you be able to lend a hand if they're really challenged by an identification. Oh, sure. I get emails all the time like that. I think it's fun. So it's like a treasure hunt, right? You, where were you? Show me some pictures. <laughs> so yeah, what, what's your handle on INAT? I think it's just Michael Kaufman. Okay. I, I suppose you could, somebody could tag you in the INAT observation too. Definitely. Yeah. So I really love to find these ecological relationships. I think the story of how things all interrelate and connect is it's always so eye-opening and every discovery or self-discovery is a novel <laughs> discovery that just keeps me going. And I alluded to this a moment ago, I've really gotten into plant galls, especially the oak galls, the cynipid wasps and, mm -hmm. uh, and leaf miners and things like that. And I'm wondering, are there similar such sort of obligate relationships between insects or other organisms and conifers that we should be looking for. Like when we do discover like, oh, it's a, it's that brewer spruce I've always been looking for. Then what's the next step? What should we look for next in, in its ecological niche? Yeah, that's a big question. Cause as we know, everything is interconnected, right? So I think one, one way to look at it is at the landscape scale. So if we see, if we begin to see the patterns in I'd love to talk about Brewer spruce, so let's talk about Brewer spruce, which is a Klamath Mountain endemic. It only grows here. It used to have a much wider range across Western North America. There's pollen records from Nevada and Wyoming when it was much wetter. As climate shifted and, and through the Pleistocene and in the Holocene, it became more and more isolated and started to hug the coast in, in the climates that mimicked those that were much more ancient. And that's the Klamath Mountains right now, right? So that's where the Brewer Spruce are. And when, as you explore the Brewer Spruce, there's this dichotomy of distribution across the range. So if you look, if you think about that plant's relationship to the landscape in the western part of the Klamath Mountains, where it's wetter, they're going to be in a more dense forest. Like in the Siskiyou Mountains, you can find them in the understory under Douglas fir or white fir. As you move more to the east, they begin to hug the north facing slope, places that are again a little bit wetter than elsewhere, often in areas that are fire have been fire free for a long time. So they might be on rocky outcrops, places that fire can't reach them. So this is their sort of relic residual habitat. Once you start to see those patterns of a species, then you can start to think about how do other ecological factors affect them like you're talking about. Is there a certain spruce budworm, say that's causing some sort of gall on a brewer spruce? And the answer is yes, there are. That, that does occur. So you start to see, well, is this an underdeveloped cone or is this actually a gall? But there's little things like that you can watch for. And then now in the age of accelerated climate change, what are the effects of 100 years of fire suppression based and then now the xerification or the aridification of the landscape so rapidly in the last 20 years 50 years. What effects of that is that having on the species? So yeah, all of these things are interacting. There's also like a mistletoe, right? That could grow on the brewer spruce. And that mistletoe is going to be a little bit different than the mistletoe that grows on the Douglas fir. And the Douglas fir is going to have insect pathogens that might be a little bit different than the insect pathogens that grow on the brewer spruce. Yeah, it, it, it's a complicated there's many complicated relationships to look for. And I'm sure there's things that have not been 
hundred percent hashed out and understood about these, about the Brewers Spruce in particular, mistletoes in general. We're in a real mistletoe hotspot here in Northwest California. So what's all these relationships with, with all the different pines and et cetera. So it's fascinating. It, that's so cool that you're looking at these gall wasps and, and leaf cutters because we got to keep looking closer. Yeah. It seems like there's so many areas that are just ripe for discovery. And I'm going to guess some of these remnant populations that are hard to get to and that, that require this extra level of inspection to make these discoveries are probably, they probably fall into that same boat, maybe more so. There's probably more discovery waiting to be made in some of these cases. And you started to hit on something I meant to ask about back to the diversity of conifers in your area. You, you mentioned a couple of really interesting things, how I, I forget the species that had needles that are productive for 70 years. And you mentioned uh, a species that's 500 years old and just hadn't been noticed or, or nobody had looked in that area. And then now you just talked about climate change and fire regimes. So in terms of disturbance, is there anything unique about the Miracle Mile and maybe the Klamath region in general in the rates of disturbance, types of disturbance that allow for this diversity to occur? Yeah, that's part of the magic of the Klamath. If we go back in time, the area was never heavily glaciated. And that had to do with its proximity to the coast. And there were glaciers, right? There's still one glacier left in the Klamath. It'll probably be here for another couple of years based on the research that's happening. It's not going to be around much longer. But the glaciers were never huge. Now, that's there, there were some big ones, right? Many miles long and the Trinity Alps in particular. But glaciers were typically small, north-facing cirques. It, it, and then when you think about glaciers, say, in the Appalachian Mountains, these things could have been hundreds of miles long, right? So they were pushing species way far south, south end of North Carolina, Georgia, what we you know, what's now North Carolina and Georgia, right? So they're moving vast sheets of ice, pushing these species south. In the Klamath Mountains, the big sheets of ice were pushed south, but they weren't pushed into the Klamath Mountains. So the Klamath has always been what's referred to as a refuge for a lot of species. So these species were sort of through the Pleistocene repeatedly pushed south, you know, from their limits in the north, south end of the Klamath, those glaciers retreated, the species were able to move back out. And because of that, people like to call the Klamath Mountains a museum. They've been able, due to this geologic complexity, the climate regime here, species have been able to both hide out, so to speak, during these major cycles in the climate, but also speciate. There's a huge number of endemic species in and that's due to climate. That's also due to geology. Pretty fascinating to think about this deep time selection of species. And the numbers are something like, and this number is probably bigger, will be bigger, but about 3,500 taxa of plants. That's rivaled only by the Southern Appalachians. And what do they have in common? Well, they were both, like I was mentioning, Monadnocks or these islands in the ice during the Pleistocene, both the Southern Appalachians and the Klamath Mountains. So very similar in a lot of respects. We even have similar taxa. Talk about the conifers, there's spruces and there's firs that are camisiparous, which is the Port Orford cedar here. There's the Eastern version of camisiparous as well. So these are all the, sort of these two areas that ex had a lot of the same uh, climatic experiences. And because of that, have this similar flora and floral diversity. This is maybe some pontification, but when I hear about the, you know, kind of the refugia that the Klamath provided. And now I think about this, the, what climate change and fire regime change is doing. Does it, does it make that region perhaps more sensitive or more at risk to the changes that are coming? Oh, definitely. There, we've had some huge fires, obviously, as a lot of California or the West has in say, even starting in 2012, even 2014, there, 2014, there was a fire that everyone predicted was going to creep into the Miracle Mile and possibly destroy that diversity. Now, thankfully, it didn't. I think it had a lot to do with, like I was saying, these spatially restricted microsites. There's a lot of granite that interferes. There's not fuel loading under that granite necessarily, so that keeps can keep fire at bay. But yeah, it's a little terrifying to think about, to be honest with you. If we think about what happened to the giant sequoias over the last two years, we've lost one quarter or so, or maybe it's a little less, 20%. <laughs> Of all the giant sequoias on earth have disappeared in the last two years because of high intensity fires, that's, that's going to happen up here. There's going to be uh, even bigger fires. The fuel loading 
in the understory of some of the forests in the Klamath Mountains is off the hook because fires have been eliminated over the past 100 to 150 years. On a positive note, there's a lot of good work happening. There's burning happening right now up here, especially around homes and small towns across the Klamath. So people are making their uh, communities more fire resilient. We're working to do more of that in maybe high elevation meadows or uh, forest systems in the higher elevations. So the idea is hopefully that, that community members continue to come together and work to repair all this damage that we've done by eliminating fire to hopefully preserve these rare conifers. Now, there's other instances where I feel like the fire probably won't be as big an issue, like I mentioned with the Miracle Mile. And hopefully there are these restricted microsites where plants continue to persist. Like I mentioned, the Pacific Silver Fir, their Southern Range extension is in the Klamath Mountains. That's the one with the 70-year-old needles. They've had some fires move through those stands in the past. It was always believed that these trees were here because these stands had remained fire-free, but fires had moved through. There was some damage, but there wasn't huge damage necessarily. I've done actually surveys on those stands. And they, so that th there's positives, but it also is, it, it's fearful to me how quickly we're drying out. We started this winter with a bang and it hasn't really rained in two months. So these things are all going to compound themselves. And hopefully there's some resiliency because of the nature of the Klamath Mountain. And the story of the giant sequoias, they require fire as part of their strategy for seed dispersal. And now hearing that 20% were lost because of too much fire, just it's, if that's not a warning call, I don't know what is. Yeah. And thankfully it sounds like people in the Southern Sierra are working on this. We need to get people in. We need to cut down these hundred year old firs that are reaching up into the canopy and acting as a ladder to get the fire up into the 200 foot canopy of a giant sequoia. People are going to have to fix this problem. We're going to have to do it quick. And, I, and it sounds like people are working on that problem down there. Yep. We created it and we're going to have to fix it. I think we are. And that's actually maybe a good segue. It's what we alluded to at the very beginning, your work to connect people to nature, connect people to Klamath and how this love of conifers and the diversity, uh, how you've turned it into something even bigger. So I, I don't know where you'd like to start. I Two things really jumped out at me. One was Backcountry Press and the other was the Bigfoot Trail. What would you like to cover first? How about we'll do it in chronologically? So when I started to write Conifer Country, which is in about 2004, I had never written a book before. I'd never had any experience publishing. And I reached out to publishers and there were, in, there were people interested in it, but it became one of these things where I had to sign the rights to my pictures and all my writing away. So long story short, the timing was right. And we decided to start our own publishing business called Backcountry Press. And Conifer Country was the first book that we did with Backcountry Press. That book took me uh, nine years. It actually turned into my master's thesis at, at uh, Humboldt State, you know, Cal Poly. And so it was great. It was peer reviewed. It was, it was a master's degree, right? So we published it. I had one of the professors at HSU tell me it was the first master's thesis he ever purchased. It was fun. <laughs> But it's still used as a textbook there for dendrology, which is very exciting. But that book helped us grow. It, 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 it's, it's pretty popular around here. People like it. And that allowed me to write Conifers of the Pacific Slope. So Conifer Country focused on the Klamath Mountains. Conifers of the Pacific Slope is all the conifers of California, Oregon, and Washington. So I like to say Conifer Country is 5% of the world's conifers. Conifers of the Pacific Slope is 10% of the world's conifers. So it's about 30 conifers treated versus 60 conifers. Pacific Slope is more of a field guide. But what was interesting with Pacific Slope is every time I was learning or meeting a new conifer for the book, there was a manzanita underneath. So that led me to my fascination with manzanitas. A uh, friend of mine, Jeff Bisbee, had been meticulously photographing all the manzanitas, which are basically in California. So we kind of got together and said, all right, let's do this book. And I got Tom Parker and Mike Vasey involved, who are the world manzanita experts. So that was our next book. And then it's just slowly burgeoned. We've um, published books for other people. I've got a natural history of the Klamath Mountains, which I've been working on for five years. That's going to be coming out in uh, September of this mm -hmm. year. 34 authors. We treat everything. Amphibian diversity is off the hook up here. Snail diversity is off the hook. So this is just, it was my personal, and in, in this book, Natural History of the Klamath Mountains, I did it 
co-edited with my friend, Justin Garwood, but we just wanted to unearth as many of the puzzles and as much of the diversity and tell that story, put a temporal timestamp on it for this period right now, because things are changing so fast, but also because it's just a fascinatingly endless exploration of natural history and the beauty of the Klamath Mountain region. So anyway, Backcountry Press has just been this uh, little, small little side hustle, so to speak, to to push nature on people, right? To get the word out. We've also started to do some online classes during the pandemic, which has been a lot of fun, mushroom classes. And we've done a natural history series on the Klamath Mountains. It's been a really nice way to inspire, to hear from folks about, hey, how about this idea? To connect with people I never would have connected with. Actually, in May, I've got a new book coming out with Phil Rundle, one of the world desert experts on California desert plants. Mm. I just went to the printer on Monday. So I'm super stoked to have to just been able to bridge and find people through this business. Hey, this is Michael from the future. And sure enough, the book went to press and I bought a copy. It's called California Desert Plants, and I highly recommend it. And the other strange part, and I'll end with this about Backcountry Press, is that Phil Rundle found me because other publishers aren't doing natural history anymore. They're not doing field guides. They're not. It's like this dying, it's just dying art. Books are difficult in general and these little niche books, but uh, they found us because we're still willing to put our uh, sweat into uh, projects that we think matter. I had a false belief that field guides were still going strong with so many great releases coming from like Princeton Press, for example. But yeah, I've since learned that some of the previously prolific publishers of field guides have just exited the business altogether. I love the fact that you're doing this and you also have adopted a lot of sustainable practices at the same time. And and I guess I'm going to have to budget away a little bit more money for some of, some of these books you have in the pipeline. They're gonna, they're good. I firmly believe that they're important contributions and, and they're also a lot of yeah. fun. And then still trying to connect people to nature, you conceived of this idea called the Bigfoot Trail. Can you tell me what it is and how it works? Yeah, sure. So I've been a long distance hiker my whole life. I've hiked chunks of the Appalachian Trail when I lived in Virginia, chunks of the Pacific Crest Trail when I lived in Southern California and Northern California now. I also hiked the entire Continental Divide Trail in 2002. I was one of two southbound hikers at the time. This was before the big uh, blow up of long trail hikers, which I think is uh, fun and fascinating. But the bottom line was when I hiked the Continental Divide Trail, I saw something like 25 conifer species between Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico. And, and I wasn't the best botanist at the time, but that's what's in my journal, right? About 25 species, over 3,000 miles. It turns out that in the Klamath Mountains, on my 360-mile Bigfoot Trail, you can see 32 species of conifers. So about a tenth of the walking, and you can see, I don't know, what, 125% of the conifers on the Continental Divide. I mean, they're not all the same, but you get my, my gist, the number of species. And all those other plants that come along with it that you <laughs> described earlier. And all the other plants. Yeah. Exactly. Big rivers to cross, and rugged mountains. So it's 360 miles. It's about 100,000 feet elevation gain in moss. I wanted to call it the biodiversity trail, but I, it was argued to me that wouldn't be as catchy. So we called it the Bigfoot Trail. And I started a nonprofit to oversee it. And I'm really excited about it. It's been, it's a slow process, but we've been able to get out and do a lot of trail work. And this is our maintenance that the Forest Service doesn't have the capacity for anymore, but they help support us. They might pack us in. They might provide a little bit of funding for us or tools. But also we have an education component where we get kids out on the trail. We're developing curriculum about the Klamath Mountains, getting that into rural communities Kids in these rural communities are doing projects and sharing data on iNaturalist or other platforms between the communities. It's really an exciting bridge to, to connect. I think it connects rural communities. It also inspires a love of nature and uh, kicks your butt too, <laughs> walking, walking to these steep mountains. Yeah, I, I have a friend who's really into backpacking up in that area. And when I learned of the Bigfoot Trail, and this is another one of those things where I, I finally drew the connection that, oh, this is you too, because I heard about the Bigfoot Trail probably a few years ago. And we started looking at it together one day pre-pandemic in the office. And wow, yeah, that would that's really a challenging trail that you've set up. And I, ha I have to ask, I've always associated Bigfoot with, say, Washington. Are there 
legends in California? It, it, does it resonate with people there? When I was eight year, eight or six, I forget that uh, famous picture of Bigfoot emerged, right? Where the one he's kind of looking back over his shoulder. Well, that was taken in the Siskiyou Mountains in the Klamath. Oh. So Bluff Creek. So I remember getting one of the scholastic things where you order the book and I got the Bigfoot book. And I remember keying in on Northern California thinking, wow, that's a place I'd love to see. So yeah, Bigfoot's the Bigfoot legends here. Now, do I believe in Bigfoot? I wish that I could believe in Bigfoot. <laughs> There's just not enough evidence, but <laughs> that all being said, it sure is a fun little twist. And uh, I kind of, I think it's a way to exemplify the wildness and in some ways, pristine nature of the Klamath Mountains. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. It's a, again, a nice evocative name. All right. So we've hit a lot of topics and all of your books are excellent resources. I already know that from experience, but I am curious if you have any other suggested reading or resources, documentaries, uh, whatever comes to mind for people that would like to learn more either about conifers or the Klamath. Yeah, sure. Uh, what turned me onto the Klamath? I mentioned I hiked the Continental Divide Trail when I ended my hike in Southern New Mexico in Silver City. I found the book on the bookshelf of the bed and breakfast I was staying in called The Klamath Knot. And that's by David Rains Wallace. And David lives in Berkeley. And he's written a lot of explorations in natural history for places across the West. But that the Klamath Knot is probably his most famous uh, book that weaves sort of the myth of the primordial st nature of the forests to deep time evolution. And it's just a fun ride. I really like David's book. So I recommend reading the Klamath Knot. And then as far as tree books go, I'll mention uh, Conifers of California by Ron Lanner. That was a real eye opener for me when I first read that one really just looks at the state of California and how amazing the conifer diversity is. And then Northwest Trees by Stephen Arno. And this touches on beyond conifers, but it's a beautiful, and he's got a new edition now. This was probably originally published in the 90s. All these books actually were published in the 90s, but Northwest Trees by Stephen Arno. So those are my three recommendations. Great. More threads to pull and, and see where it takes us all. And talking about connecting people with nature, I have this model that I've described before that I call the ladder of environmental care. And I, I'm always looking at ways to help people move up the ladder to either connect with nature or, or go beyond just connecting and actually then protecting. So I'm wondering what you found to be most effective in getting people to be able to move up a rung on that proverbial ladder. Well, that's a really good question. I'm a life time educator. I've taught kindergarten through college and I still do. I, I work in classrooms across Humboldt County and my top level goal with teachers is to get them and their students asking questions, hopefully getting, even getting them outside. I work for say the Redwoods League. We're getting ready to start a bunch of field trips where we'll take kids to the parks and inspire them. But again, it's asking questions, figuring out the systematic way to answer those questions and then pursuing that and finding like something passionate about your place. And for me, it's turned into conifers. It's turned into manzanitas. But what is it that you're passionate about that you need to find out more about? And then how can you share that with other people? So how can we continue to spread the word? And I think as far as activism and making the world a better place, I think that comes down to the local level. And I'm still convinced this is the only way to do it, but maybe it's joining a trail working crew on weekends to, to clean up whatever, the local trail in your neighborhood, or maybe it's creating a bio blitz for a small nonprofit land trust that needs to ex assess the biodiversity on a new piece of land that they're protecting, whatever it might be, right? But working at the local level to, again, connect people to the natural world is, we just need more of it. Those are some great ideas and uh, insights. So. Do you have any other projects that you'd like to highlight? I'll just mention again, California Desert Plants, May 2022. Super excited about that one. The Natural History of the Klamath Mountains is uh, September 2022, but we're also working on the new mushroom book with Christian Schwartz and Noah Siegel. Again, they couldn't find a publisher and we were, we're right there ready to work with them. They, they did uh, Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast. We're going to do uh, Mushrooms of Cascadia with them. And I, I haven't announced this to anyone, but the book should be out by uh, 2023, fall 2023 is our goal. So we're just excited to continue to do projects, field guides, connecting people to the natural world. And that's where we're at. 
that's super exciting. So yeah, your pipeline of books is even bigger than I realized. <laughs> if people do want to follow you or your work, where should they go? Yeah, michaelkaufman.net is where I occasionally do blogs, but you can see some of my publications, both research based or just natural history book based stuff. I'm not huge on the social media thing, but I do have the Instagram and the iNaturalist. And those are all linked there. Or, or just at my email contact, right? Shoot me an email if you've got a question or an inspiration. So I'm easy to find. All right. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you taking the time today with me to ask some, I guess, some basic questions, but you were patient with me. So I appreciate that. Well, those are, you had some good questions. It, it, it made me think a little bit more than maybe my normal conflict <laughs> talks. So thanks. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for sticking through the entire episode. If you made it this far, I hope that it means that you enjoyed it. If so, please spread the word and share this episode with three friends or groups that you think would enjoy it too. As for today's episode, let me know. Did I miss anything? Was there a topic I should have covered? Let me know at podcast at jumpstartnature.com or DM me on any of my social accounts. I'll do my best to answer your questions. You can find me at Nature's Archive, one word, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I also share photography, nature stories, and much more on those accounts, so you can follow just to stay in touch, too. And despite being called crazy by numerous friends and colleagues, last year I left my tech career behind to start Jumpstart Nature, which Nature's Archive is now part of. For the sake of myself, my family, and the planet, I need to make this work, so please also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash jumpstartnature. I offer some exclusive content and perks, and you can start donations as low as $4 a month. Lastly, please also check out our latest creation. It's the Jumpstart Nature podcast. We just completed our pilot season where each episode reveals an unseen, surprising, or misunderstood nature topic with the help of experts and our host, Griff Griffith. It's entertaining and inspiring and even reached number three on the Apple Nature podcast charts. There's much more on our roadmap, but we need your support. So check out jumpstartnature.com for more details. Thank you.